I want to start this video with a big thank you to everyone who's been watching the rundown and leaving their feedback and everything. It got a lot more attention than I was expecting it to get in such a short amount of time. Uh, I think you've doubled my uh, subscriber count. Not that that was a very difficult task to do, but it seems pretty obvious that it's the most popular content, at least as far as engagement, on my channel. So I'll be doing more of these in the future. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to say. Thanks, everybody. So we've covered the what in regards to accelerationism in the rundown, but what about the why in regards to accelerationism? Why is accelerationism a useful framework? Should I want to accelerate things at all? To me, I feel these are actually some of the more unexplored areas of accelerationism. As a standalone theory, accelerationism is conspicuously robust. It has managed to gain a pretty substantial foothold for something which was born out of drugs, the occult, schizophrenia, and jungle music. Personally, I think the theory has already proved more than influential enough to justify it not being ignored. So in this video, rather than talking about what other people think about accelerationism, I'll talk a little bit more about what I think accelerationism is and why I've been so drawn to it. First, let's get something important out of the way right off the bat. I don't really want to accelerate things. At least, not in the way you would expect. There are reasons here. Personally, I don't think we have the proper praxis to accelerate things on our own. I don't think that it's in our wheelhouse to steer the ship. Uh, put that on the back burner for now, though. I'm also skeptical that accelerationism, or at least the thing that accelerationism is paying attention to, can simply be assumed as good for humanity. Overall, however, I agree that accelerationism is happening. I think there is a certain degree of potential energy being unleashed by capitalism, positive feedback loops, all that seems undeniable. Of course, capitalism and intelligence explosion, nothing like this has ever happened in the history of Earth, but there's evidence to suggest nothing like this has ever happened in the history of the galaxy. At the very least, it's worth considering whether there are larger forces or laws at work than we generally assume. However, I'm also skeptical that blind commitment to these forces is generally the best idea for humanity as a whole. A common thing thrown around in relation to accelerationism is the idea of transhumanism, typically associated with overcoming human limitations through technological means, machinic implants, gene editing, that sort of thing. Elon Musk is famously working on Neuralink, which is an attempt at overcoming the bandwidth issue with our brain and information. I'm deeply skeptical of what sort of transhumanism this would create, however. Imagine a naive thought experiment with me for a moment. Musk invents a brain implant that gives you live access to Wikipedia in the same way you access memory. If you're thinking about geometry, you remember all the normal stuff, what you learned in school, but you also remember the geometry page from Wikipedia in photographic detail as well as every related page, related pages, related pages, etc. It's a rather minor technological feat in the large scope of transhumanist idealism, and yet even this would manifest itself in such radical ways. I mean, consider, would it be cheating if you had one for an academic exam? Do you have to turn it off? Can you turn it off? Does the government have control over it? Does Musk? Will employers expect you to get one? I mean, these are all questions humans, as a, a, a species, they never had to deal with this in an imminent sense. Michael Phelps, the most famous swimmer, you know, his genetics are incredibly different than most people's. He was born with an explicit genetic advantage to swim. So what about when we get to a point where you can begin to pay to alter that genetic advantage? And don't doubt for even a moment that China isn't figuring out how to grow genetically superior humans right now, because they are openly talking about it. As a scientist and the father of two girls, safety is my number one concern above all else. The gene we choose, CCR5, is one of the best studied genes. In fact, about 100 million people naturally has genetic variations that disable CCR5, protecting them against HIV. They were healthy. Our surgery caught exactly at this 
the start of that natural variation. Can a genetically grown lab baby compete against regular humans in sports? What if they absolutely cream even Michael Phelps, like the best of our genetic lottery for swimmers? What if China starts manufacturing its Olympic team in the near future? What if China starts manufacturing its army? And here's the biggest rub of all. How much is all this going to cost? And this is an important one because obviously the rich will have much higher levels of access to biotechnology. And if it's anything like the science fiction stories we're all familiar with, another class division will quickly develop between modified and non-modified. And this is something accelerationism has given the inelegant neologism hyper-racism. I don't even think I need to say much more about the idea. If a distinction opens up between modified and unmodified, what we are watching is in effect the development of the distinction not between transhuman and human, but rather non-human and human. And I think transhumanists are incredibly naive on the political and corporate ramifications of their projects. And it's very idealistic to assume that these lines of flight are anything less than lines of flight from humanity itself. This is to say, I would consider transhumanism as an idealistic form of posthumanism, a position that to me is more open to the issues inherent to the ideas, and one I'm more sympathetic to. The issue here is also that I don't think reactionary politics really works. You can't simply say no to acceleration. I think posthumanism should be taken more seriously because if the end of humanity as we know it is approaching, we should at the very least try and get our last will and testament in order. Here's another naive thought experiment. Imagine you can go back to an older species which predates humans, say Homo habilis. You can communicate with him and you can try to describe to him that one day his entire species will be extinct. Everyone he knows and loves, his people, his culture, will all be gone and forgotten. But, through random genetic mutation, some force larger than him that he has no conscious control over, a new species very much like him will emerge, but much more capable, one that will perform feats so spectacular he cannot even comprehend them. And not only that, yet he will be considered archaic, outdated, unneeded. No one will seek to go back. No one will try and revive the Homo habilis. Would he believe you? Could he believe you? Now imagine that Homo sapien, sapien, whatever our official biological species name is. What if that is just another step in evolution? Just like Homo habilis, not something which can be preserved indefinitely. Something that's going to have to be left behind. But, if we are taking this next evolutionary step into our own hands through biogenetics, etc., we need to recognize both the responsibility this entails and also the dramatic break it represents. I would go on further about, you know, AI, singularity, whatever, but I think you get my point here. Ethics, human ethics, needs to be considered because, as hard as it might be to imagine, in the long run these advancements will create gaps between us and what's next, and these gaps may be much more significant than the one between us and Homo habilis. And that's a scary, scary thought. The human aspect is, by my account, all but ignored in modern accelerationist praxis. I mean, there's elements of it in LAC, I suppose, but they tend to kind of fall by the wayside. And again, this doesn't mean we aren't going to accelerate or that we shouldn't accelerate, but rather a modest suggestion that we should at least attempt to have a few of these hard conversations before the market has them for us. What is the ultimate end of technological progress? Oh, the answer is easy one. It's to make us, if we follow the immanent logic of technology, to build machines which will beat us so that we humans will no longer be needed. And this is not kind of a metaphysical irony. Look, isn't it our big goal is to build an artificial intelligence which will surpass us? And we are playing with devil here, we know. Because what if that intelligence will decide that it will no longer need us, and so on and so on. But I think there definitely is this self-destructive dimension in technology. Not in the sense of we will kill ourselves, but in the sense of we will become useless. We will become that proverbial ladder just used to climb up and then 
artificial intelligence, you can call it singularity now or whatever, will throw us away. This is one of the reasons I sympathize so closely with GIAC. They don't play idealistic games about these issues, but rather try to approach them from a brutally realistic perspective. Unlike a lot of people in the accelerationist space, they are concerned with concrete problems of becoming other. I'm sure when it comes down to it, we may disagree on praxis, but I think they are one of the only blank acts that seem eager to deal with the hard questions anymore. Also, much love to Nix for the shout out. I'm a huge fan of her work and that really means a lot to me. Our act is something I still don't quite understand. It idealizes the human, but in a weirdly borderline fetishistic way, pretending that things like optimization for widespread human and IQ proliferation should be a goal, but they don't tend to consider the fact that general IQ distributions may be totally inconsequential to the rise of non-human intelligences. This notion that only the proper human stock can give rise to AI it to me seems like the definition of fetishistic anthropocentrism. How are you supposed to determine we are off course if we haven't even managed to plot a course yet? Maybe non? 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 I don't think I've ever actually said it out loud before if I'm being honest. Maybe the process knows damn well what's going on when it comes to IQ distributions. RAC and LAC, from where I'm standing at least, they both seem pretty much dead. Neo Reaction took on most of the ship jumpers from ARAC, and LAC had its heart in the right place, but it never seemed to manage to stand on its own two feet. Probably stemming from its chaotic mix of ideologies containing everything from Kaczynskiists to Bio-Leninists. The one major unifying figure in the movement left us all too early, and I don't think that it was really ever able to pull itself out of a death spiral. Xenofeminism is great for attempting to propose more concrete potentials for the human, in which, in combination with its influence writ large, probably makes it the most successful of the movement so far, at least on paper, but how the all-encompassing process is going to deal with these emancipatory projects, none of that's been decided yet. I'm worried whenever a movement begins to think that the process is working for them, and I feel like there are elements of this sort of idealism in xenofeminism, at least strains of it, which can always pose a stumbling block for the movement. UAC is probably the most widespread position among the accelerationist space as I see it today, largely because of its rejection of deterministic praxis. This worked in its favor in two ways, really. They have managed to avoid the LAC death spiral, even with the inclusion of incredibly broad and incompatible ideologies, it still manages to act as a successful container, and, you know, related to that second, it allows other movements to piggyback off of it. In practice, it works sort of like an overflow container, and I think in that sense, UAC is quite useful. So what do I think if none of the blank acts really work or work for me? Well, firstly, I'm not trying to create a new blank act. I don't think that's going to help here. Instead, I want to simply propose a return from praxis back to theory. I think we have enough blank acts. What we need is more lands. This is the basic rundown of modernity as I see it. Accelerationism is happening. Accelerationism might not be a good thing for people. Most people who believe in accelerationism want to speed everything up without a clear motive or praxis. Most people who don't know about accelerationism speed everything up anyways because that's the way this whole thing works. Now obviously it's a matter here, first and foremost, of recognition. The more people we can get looking at capitalism as some quasi-malicious AI which may or may not end the human species, it's probably a good thing to keep an eye on. The more eyes on this, the better. I fear, however, though, that we might be facing an issue of territorialization upon the accelerationist body today. Any movement has a tendency to establish groups of identity, but I think accelerationism is particularly vulnerable to this tendency, as the face of unknowing is a unique sort of horror. Having a position, any position at all, feels a lot better than staring into that abyss. But for me, these groups are really only useful to the degree that they can help generate theory. They're not useful as categories of identity. I personally have a lot of sympathy with the Stoic position, which I think is probably the best praxis to take, at least insofar as it can foster theory. 
I think that we shouldn't jump to conclusions about whether accelerationism is good or bad, whether collapse is good or bad, whether we should speed everything up or tear everything down. We should instead be attentive, we should be alert, we should wait, we should think, we should discuss. Yes, Lance says we don't have time to wait, we don't have time to think, that the time to think is decades in the past, and I actually agree with him here wholeheartedly. But if this is happening, if the choices we have are either think or don't think, because the action is already in motion, the boulder's already rolling down the hill, then what's the point in picking not think? We need more theory. Try and calculate some sort of trajectory of the goddamn boulder, you know, determine the slope or the mass of the rock, something. Resistance, support, any type of praxis, it can't be done blind, or at least it can't be done blind and properly. And I think in this respect, this very specific respect, I'm not an accelerationist. I don't simply want to pick my accelerationist team and get back to playing politics. I want to continue the accelerationist critique into something concrete. And this is, I think, why I decided to do this, you know, series. It's not because I want to win people over to accelerationism, or I think accelerationism is some kind of magic key that's going to create the perfect future. I think it's a lens of critique. And that critique as a theory is best used, not followed. One of Nick Land's approaches, which has become influential for people like Negrestani, is that philosophy should be treated as something like a bag of tools. They have uses and they have outcomes in the philosophical project. Philosophy does something. And it's useful, it's important to experiment, combine, deconstruct, reconsider. You can never leave an idea unsullied. And that goes twice for accelerationism. And another reason why I'm kind of doubtful of the praxis that's going on right now is that almost every attempt to accelerate anything has failed, at least intentional attempts. And that means even the most earnest praxis has the risk of backfiring. Here's an example. I advocate for some strong regulation of capitalism. I'll get into that in a second. But imagine we propose a machine ethics law. May that slow down research? Capitalism as a whole? Maybe. Yeah, sure. Will it prevent us prematurely from ending the species through a military AI bug, war game style? Yeah, maybe, sure. I mean, if it's our job to foster intelligence, and maybe it is, maybe that involves fostering the human long enough to see, you know, intelligence succeed. And these are just some of the problems that I see with today's praxis, and why I have trouble considering myself any of the blank act categories. So what do I suggest for future praxis? I think we need to consider a position which both accepts that accelerationism is happening and that it is only possible to go through with it to its ends, but also one which recognizes that the only real concern we have in the process is the hospice of humanity. If mankind is in a terminal condition, we need the proper painkillers, mythology, gravesite, and all of that comes through theory, not through praxis. Put another way, we need to make the transition as painless as possible for mankind, and that's going to involve some sort of proper mythology, ideology, perspective, whatever you want to call it, towards what this next thing is going to be, hopefully one which has some sort of, you know, respect for human dignity, or at least the human burial, as it were, and we need the proper gravesite or lines of escape for the post-human. You know, we need to choose where we're going to be left. Hopefully something a little more aspirational than, you know, some simulation on a drive somewhere. This is why I consider myself something of an accelerationist, but also something of a communist along the lines of Jameson, Fisher, Zizek. I think that capitalism is exploitative, and that it isn't working along a logic which is beneficial for mankind. But I am also rejecting the utopian socialist ideas of revolution and the inevitability of mankind being the actor which will overcome capitalist contradictions once and for all. Capitalism so far has been overcoming its own contradictions, you know, it hasn't relied on us. And what's more, it seems to thrive on those contradictions. And socialism in particular, you know, as a contradiction, has been perfectly packaged and marketed, sold back to the anti-capitalist masses. So if everything is already in motion, and either way we are already tending towards extinction, 
and stepping back from the process to consider lines of human dignity simply means going up in flames while in the midst of deep study, contemplative and monk-like, well, that's probably not the worst way we could go. Now, I probably sound pretty pessimistic, and I probably am pretty pessimistic, but I'm not a nihilist. I don't think any of this is pointless. And I think there are things you can do as an individual, however small they may be. There are infinite points of input in a circuit, so to speak. If you are interested in playing a long game and preserving human dignity for the time being at the very least, advocate for machine ethics. That's a big deal. Advocate for international treaties regulating things like biogenetics. Will it help? Who knows? Probably not, to be honest. I personally think that these will be fruitless without a strong global form of enforcement, not only to protect us from things like AI, but also from ourselves as well. Things like nuclear weapons and the pollution of the environment. None of these things obey borders. They don't obey patch lines. That's one of the problems I see with patchwork. It only takes one rogue patch to ruin everything. It doesn't really matter how utopian of a patch you can design that will, you know, amalgamate everybody eventually towards it. If one party decides it's in their best interest to fuck up the planet, that's it. I mean, we're in a future where any state can legitimately pose a threat to everyone on the planet if they really try hard enough. I like to think of this in more Hegelian terms, I guess, along the lines of developing consciousness. We should be striving to reach a point where we recognize and are aware of the issues we face. Only then can we develop effective lines of praxis. Only then can we attempt to steer the ship again. This is probably something close to an amalgamation of Fisher and Zizek's political stance. But both have never quite been accepted by any orthodox movement. So where this leaves me on the spectrum isn't exactly as clear as I'd like it to be. Um, I have some unpublished writings floating around in cyberspace, I'll link a couple down in the description. I can almost guarantee they won't clear much up. Uh, sorry for the long and evasive answer, this has been my accelerationist blog post as it were. Next video we're going to be getting back into good old theory, taking a shot at understanding Kant and his theory of intensity, and the nature of time in relation to Nick Land's teleoplexy. So if you want to do some reading ahead, Teleoplexy is probably a good place to start. It's short, but it'll take a couple dozen readings to really wrap your brain around, at least it did for me. Thank you once again for being with me. Uh, I hope very much to see you next time when we break into the big old German brain of Immanuel Kant.